Hello, Dr. Roberts. Thank you so much for taking the time out to meet with me today. Um, and just for all of your service that you've provided to our city over these past three years as you've been our um, health commissioner. And especially during this year of this pandemic, you have been advocating for our community and for the health of our community. So I know you're busy. So thank you so much for taking the time out. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So last year in May, Franklin County declared racism a public health crisis. And you obviously were a part of that declaration as our health commissioner. Um, and I think a lot of people watching this, most people watching this video will understand that racism is a huge issue, um, not just in our county, but in our country, in the world but perhaps you can help us to understand the link between racism and public health. You know, why declare racism a public health crisis? Well, thanks for that question. And I, I would really remind everyone, it was really February of 2020 that Mayor Ginther declared racism a public health crisis. And he asked me as a health commissioner to come up with recommendations for how our city could address that how we could address racism as a public health crisis and what we needed to do. Um, following that, the Franklin County Commissioners, Franklin County Public Health, Columbus Public Health, and Columbus City Council also then moved forward in declaring racism a public health issue. Um, and there's no doubt about it that public health um, and racism um, are, do play a role together. We know that the health of our community is different there are disparities between our black and brown residents compared to our Caucasian residents. And that creates a public health crisis. Those disparities, those inequalities in care, inequalities in access to some of the normal things that we all take for granted, whether it's transportation, safe housing, good education, those are disparities that are drastically different in our black and brown individuals than in our Caucasian individuals. And that then has a public health in, impact because black and brown people don't have the same life expectancy as our white counterparts. We have a much shorter life expectancy. Why is that? Is it because of our genes? Not necessarily. A lot of it is due to the social determinants of health, which are all public health issues that we need to be working on. I'm so glad that you said that social determinants of health, um, because we have seen firsthand how that's played out with COVID-19 in our communities. The disproportionate impact on communities of color um, has gotten a lot of people to start really looking at public health and how it relates to um, people of color. So you guys declared racism as a public health crisis. So what has that declaration allowed um, communities to do? How has that impacted what we can do to kind of fight those uh, health disparities? Well, I think first you have to recognize it and acknowledge it. And by the mayor acknowledging it, county commissioners acknowledging it, city council and boards of health acknowledging it, now we can do something about it. It's really hard to do something if you don't acknowledge that it exists. And now we have multiple um, leaders, multiple municipalities acknowledging that it exists. So now we've put it out there, we know it exists. And like you said, this pandemic has really allowed everyone to see it firsthand, how racism does affect health and how black and brown individuals have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And some of them are really obvious. You know, Why did we see so many minorities getting COVID-19 early in the pandemic compared to Caucasians? Well, many minorities have worked frontline jobs, whether it's working in the food service industry or in the transportation industry. They did not have the luxury of working from home. When everyone was advised to stay home and work from home, if you had a job that really required you to be there in person, like many of our black and brown individuals do, you couldn't stay home. You couldn't avoid contact with others. And back in the early days of the pandemic in March and April, we weren't wearing masks. So you didn't have that layer of protection. And so we had many more minorities getting sick. And then we also know that many minorities live in multi-generational households. So, you know, you've got your 40-year-old mom of three with her husband, and then you've got her parents or her mom staying with them. So you've got three generations living in one household. So if one person in that house gets sick, and if they live in small quarters, 
with one bathroom, it's really going to be easy for that virus to spread throughout the whole family. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why black and brown people were disproportionately affected by this virus, particularly early on. But if you don't acknowledge that something exists, it's really hard to address it. And so by declaring racism a public health issue, it allows all of us to now address it since we've acknowledged it. Wow. Yeah, that's really great. You know, calling it out and calling it you know, the issues out for what they are um, is definitely necessary in making steps towards change. So how have you guys seen over the past year, how has the declaration, um, you know, impacted uh, public health so far? Well, I think for me and for my department, it's really made us look through that racism lens with all the work we're doing. You know, I go back to last June when we really started making testing more available. I knew that there was testing available through all of our hospital systems here in town, but for many individuals who weren't connected to care or didn't have the luxury of getting their health care from one of our four wonderful healthcare systems here, they had challenges getting tested. Um, they would have to wait weeks to get their results. They might have to pay out of pocket to get a test. And so I made arrangements to have testing done right here at the health department with partnership with our three adult hospitals who volunteered their services to test our residents. And there was a central number that individuals could call to get tested. I did that with that racial lens on to make sure that anyone in our community who wanted to get testing would have access to testing. All they had to do is to know what number to call. And we worked really hard to get that number out everywhere. So that was one example early on. And then we did a lot of information, making sure we translated information so um, people who spoke different languages could understand. And then when we had a vaccine, we've been working really hard to make sure our black and brown individuals understand the vaccine, know where to get the vaccine. And in many occasions, we are bringing the vaccine to them. Wow, that's awesome. And that's so huge. I mean, we've seen that um, being able to be tested and knowing those numbers has made a huge impact on, you know, the spread of the virus and uh, lowering that curve, as you will. So that is powerful. So now that um, we've declared racism a public health crisis in Franklin County, um, what is it going to take for us to declare racism as a public health crisis um, in Ohio on the state level? Well, I wish I had the answer to that, Lauren, because, um, but since I'm not at the state level, I, I can't speak for them. Um, I think what we're worried about is locally what it means for us here in Franklin County. Um, I would hope that the state would accept that and declare that too, um, but I, I really can't speak for them on that. Okay. So since we are still seeking out those answers about how to advocate for declaring racism as a public health crisis on the state level, maybe you can share with us um, some ways that we can get involved beyond the declaration, how we can start to fight for racial equity and public health um, in our advocacy and our activism as individuals. Well, I think first of all, we just need to make sure that all individuals are treated the same. And so we know that does not always exist. So we need to do a lot of cultural competence and training. Um, we need to advocate that there's cultural competence training at all levels. And that I think would even include some of our K through 12 um, education. Um, but we need to advocate for employers to think about that and who they employ, who's at the table, as well as what benefits they offer all of their employees. So advocating for those social determinants of health too, we know we are short affordable housing here in Franklin County. We need more affordable housing. That will have an impact on health. And we know there's a racial divide when it comes to affordable housing. Thinking about food access, um, that's also something. So really focusing on those social determinants of health, education, transportation, housing, food availability, and then access to care. Awesome. And I just have one more question. So we know that um, mental health plays a huge role in public health overall and definitely um, takes a huge toll on communities of color. How um, will the toll racism takes on mental health be addressed by the declaration? Well, again, declaring it makes people aware of it and now you can do something about it. And you're absolutely right. 
mental health um, does affect all people, but disproportionately affects black and brown individuals. And it's something we need to talk about more openly. And this pandemic has really escalated the mental health issues we're all experiencing. This has been a very trying and taxing time. And depending on how you have managed and handled this, there are some people who have gotten into depression as a result of this pandemic. Um, being away from loved ones, um, having so much insecurity and not knowing where your next meal might come from, or if your job is going to remain stable. Um, those are all stressors that can really exacerbate any mental health issue. So we need to talk about mental health more openly. Um, we need to accept that it's part of our overall health, including our physical health. Um, and I think by declaring racism a public health issue, it acknowledges us to talk about racism in all aspects of our life, our physical health, our mental health, our financial health as well. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Roberts, for being a champion of health um, for Black and Brown people and communities of color and for doing the work that you do um, and for meeting with me today. It was so great talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You take care, Lauren. You too. Goodbye.